is the way, the truth, and the life. Say amen. 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 Our key verse in this series in Colossians. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted, and now being built up in Him, and established in your faith. There's a story that is told of Leonardo da Vinci. You see his famous picture on the screen. And as he was finishing this picture that we know as the Last Supper, he invited one of his friends to come over and critique the picture before it was ever seen by anyone else. And so the friend came into the room and he saw the painting and in examining the painting, he made this statement. The most striking thing in the painting is the cup. Well, Leonardo da Vinci, having heard that, took his brush and he went to the painting and he covered over the cup and made this statement. There will never, ever be anything in my painting that takes the attention away from the face of my master. Do you see the cup? It's not there. It's gone. It was in the middle when he first painted it. Nothing will take the attention away from the face of my Master. For this reason, Jesus is center stage. Jesus is the preeminent Christ he is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is God incarnate. The Bible, the Bible, the Old Testament, Moses, the prophets, the wisdom literature, the Psalms, the law, all of the Old Testament gives us an understanding that Jesus Christ is going to come. The Gospels announce that He has arrived, that He is here, and tell of the story of His ministry, His life, death, and resurrection. The book of Acts gives us an understanding that this Christ who died, who rose again to new life, began this message to be spread throughout all the world. The epistles give us an understanding of how we as believers are to live out our life in Jesus Christ. And then you come to Revelation and He's going to come again. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings will come and reign for all eternity. The Bible gives us an understanding of who Jesus is. Christ is. Every part of Scripture testifies to Jesus Christ. Do you remember as Luke records as Jesus is walking with the disciples after His resurrection in Luke 24, 27 as He's walking on the way to Emmaus Jesus makes this statement beginning with Moses the Scripture says beginning with Moses and all the prophets Jesus, He, Jesus explain to them all things concerning Himself that was in Scripture. In John 5, 9, Jesus says about the Scriptures, These bear witness to who I am, bears witness to me. Philip preached to the Ethiopian eunuch from Isaiah, and the man was saved as he preached about this coming Messiah. But one of the most wonderful passages in all of Scripture that records who Jesus Christ is is our verses today. It's considered one of the great hymns of Scripture. In fact, it's believed that this was probably recited 
or sung or chanted in the early church after Paul had penned these words about Jesus the Christ. As I mentioned in the introduction to this series, we talked about the heresies that the Colossian church was facing, Epaphras going and sharing these with Paul in prison in Rome. These heresies often centered on the person of Jesus Christ. It centered on Him being human instead of divine. They denied His humanity. That He was lesser than God or that He was created as angels were created. They have this philosophical dualism going on. They believed also that the Spirit was good and the flesh was evil. And it was absurd to them that in this case that God would take on human flesh which was considered to be evil. So they denied the deity. They considered that salvation was not enough through Jesus Christ. It was required some knowledge or secret knowledge or special knowledge to take place. They believed that worshiping angels were okay. Ceremonial law, Jewish law, needed to be a part of all when it came to salvation. And so Paul confronts this heresy. He rejects that they deny Jesus as divine. In the second chapter, when we get there to the ninth verse, it says, For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And so Paul comes to this place where he reveals the true identity of Jesus Christ. If you have your scriptures and you want to follow along this morning, these verses are found in chapter 1 of Colossians, verses 15 through 19. Hear this, the Word of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the first born of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Follow me the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Illuminate our hearts and minds to hear what you would hold for us through this passage today, Father. We pray it in your precious name. Amen. This morning I want to look at this preeminence of Jesus Christ. And I want to look at it through these verses in three different movements. First is, He is God. Second, talk about Jesus. Second, Jesus is Creator. And third, Jesus is the head of the church. So first, Jesus Christ is God. He is God. He is not an offshoot of God. He's not a replica of God. He's not some semblance of God. He is God. He is part of the triune God. Paul describes Him as the image of the invisible God. The Scriptures tell us that, that God was not seen. You remember when God went by, He said, you turn your head, you see my back, but you can't see my face. But here Jesus becomes the image of the invisible God. The Greek word, eikon, means image, likeness. And it's the word that we get, our word, English word, icon. And so Jesus is perfect, absolutely accurate in the image of God. He did not become the image of God in His creation. He was the image, He was God 
from eternity. All of eternity, all of time, Jesus was God. First Hebrews 1.3 describes Jesus as the radiance of God's glory, similar to the sunlight reflects from the sun, Jesus Christ. Glory is a reflection of God's glory. He is the exact representation of God's nature. You remember when Jesus was asked about um, giving to Caesar or giving to the church, giving you know, to, to God, and he asked for a coin and they brought a coin to him and he said, whose face is on this coin, on this denarius? And they said, Caesar. And on that coin was the exact representation, the picture of Caesar. And this is what Paul is saying. Jesus is God. The word there was in exact representation is like a tool and die where you take it and stamp. If someone takes a tool and die and my name is Marty Cafell and they write out Marty Cafell, that is exact representation of my name. This is what Jesus is saying in the scriptures. This is what Paul is giving us. Jesus is the exact. He is God in all ways. And this is why in John 14, 9, Jesus can say without any reservation or hesitation, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Philippians 2 says that He is the exact likeness of God in every form, in the very form of God. So in Christ, we see the invisible God made visible. By using this word, ikon, Paul emphasizes that Jesus is both not only the representation, but He is the manifestation of God. He is the full, final, complete revelation of who God is in human flesh. So by His testimony during His ministry, by the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, Jesus Christ, is God. And to see Him in any other fashion is to be blinded by Satan. In this 15th verse, Paul not only says that He is the image of the invisible God, but He is the firstborn of creation, of all creation. <coughs> now, from the Arians in the early church, their heresy, to the Jehovah Witnesses of today, they use this phrase to say, see, God can't, Jesus Christ cannot be God if He is the firstborn of creation. That means that He is born. So they argue that Christ is created, a created being, instead of eternal God. The problem is that this interpretation completely misunderstands the meaning of prototokos, which is the Greek word for firstborn. It ignores the context of the Scripture. This word means in the Greek two things, not one. First, it means chronological, as in Luke 2, 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Jesus was Mary's firstborn, chronological. But most often in Scripture, if you go to the Septuagint, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, over 130 times this word firstborn relates to the second meaning, not chronological, but it means status or rank in the family. And this is the meaning here. And so, both in the Jewish and the Greek culture, the firstborn son had the right to the inheritance, but not always the firstborn son, meaning chronological, received that inheritance. And I can just give you easily two examples. Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn. No. 
when you go to Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was born before Isaac. So Ishmael was born first. Isaac was born second. Isaac got the blessing. You go to Jacob and Esau, and the scriptures beforehand give the understanding that the younger will be lord over the older. The older will serve the younger, even before they were born. And so Esau, being firstborn, did not get the inheritance, get the blessing, but Jacob did. And so not always in Scripture was the firstborn the one that was inherited. And so this is position. This is rank. In Hebrews 1 and Revelation 5, both of these passages say that Jesus is the one that has the right inheritance of His Father in heaven. He is the firstborn of all creation. You look at even the nation of Israel. They were not the first nation that was born in Exodus 4.22. God says that these people of this nation will be the firstborn, will be my people. And then God in Psalm 89, the 27th verse, God says of the Messiah this, I shall make Him, meaning Jesus, my Son, I will make Him the firstborn. And then He defines what that means in this psalm. He says, and He will be the King of kings. He will be the highest of any king ever in the heavens or the earth. And so this interpretation to mean that Christ was a created being is out of harmony, not only with the understanding here of the meaning of the word, but even with the context of the scripture. And you have to interpret scripture with scripture. And so as you look at these verses, Paul in the next verse refers to Jesus Christ as Creator. He is Creator in everything in Him. All exists. How could Christ be a created being and at the same time be Creator? So Paul slams the door to their heresy. Jesus Christ is God who took on flesh. Next, Paul says in this preeminence of Jesus Christ that He is not only God, but He is Creator God. Creator of the universe. He says, for by Him, who? Him, Jesus Christ, for by Him all things were created. Not some. Not a few, not some over here, and not over here. All things were created. When we study the universe, when we study creation, it can be mind-boggling. I think so often we take our world, our the created universe, for granted. We get up this morning, we do things, we anticipate that the sun's going to rise and set today. It's done it every day that all of us have lived and we consider that it's going to do it today. The universe is staggering when you think about it. The sun, the sun is 564,000 miles in diameter. Think about that. It is 864 miles in diameter. You can take, it's 100 times the diameter of the earth. You can take 1.3 million of the earth and put it inside of the sun. It's amazing. You look at the travel of the sunlight from the sun to the earth, 186 miles per second. It takes 8.5 8.5 minutes for sunlight to reach from the sun to the earth traveling at 186 miles per second. That same speed of light takes four years to reach the nearest star. And it's 
said that just in our universe, the Milky Way, there's billions and billions of stars. To the point they have said that the stars in our universe, you could say, is 10 to the 25th power. And if you are a mathematician, they say that is as many as the grains of sands on the shores of the sea across the earth. That's how many stars are in the heavens. This is our Creator God who has created all things. The testimony of God being Creator, of Jesus being Creator, is so clear in Scripture. In Romans 1.20, Paul writes, Since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His, talk about Christ, eternal power, divine nature, has been clearly seen, being understood through what was made, so that there is no excuse to believe that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. And anyone that rejects Christ as Creator God, again, is blinded by Satan. Jesus' supremacy, primacy as Creator is that He was before all things. The passage says He is before all things. When the, earth, the universe began, He already existed. John 1 and 1 John 1 is Sukkot talk in 1 John says that Jesus was before all things. He already existed. Jesus told the Jews in John 8.58, Before Abraham, I am. Not I was, I am. In other words, I existed in all of eternity. I am Creator God. I live eternally. The Genesis story in 126 tells us, let us, us make man in our image. And the us here is the triune God. We know the Spirit was hovering over the waters before creation. We know that God the Son, God the Father, all with the Holy Spirit, this plurality of the Godhead is a part of creation. In Revelation 22:13 describes Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was the first and the last. Anyone existing before time has to be Creator God, Eternal God, this preeminence. But not only does Paul say that He is Creator God, but he also says that as Creator God, He holds all things together. Through Him, for Him, all things are held together. He is the sustainer of the universe in which we live. If God was to take His hand off of this universe, it would be in chaos. He holds the balance. He holds it together. His power consistency, holds the gravity, centrifugal force. He is the one that keeps things in motion, keeps things going the way they need to go as far as the energy of our universe. Anything less if He was not holding it together. It would explode. How do we know that? In his book, Dr. Lee Chestnut in the, ad, the book was the Adam Speaks. I want you to hear what he says. He says he describes the way the nucleus of an atom in the world is held together. He says, Consider the dilemma of a nuclear physicist, phys physicist when he finally looks in utter amazement at the pattern he has drawn out about the oxygen nucleus. For here are eight positive charged protons closely associated together within the confines of this tiny nucleus of this atom. With them are eight neutrons, a total of 16 particles, eight positively charged, eight with no charge. Here's the dilemma. 
physicists had discovered that light charges of electricity, light magnetic poles, repel each other, but unlike, attract each other. And so this electrical ph uh, uh, phenomenon and uh, this electrical equipment that had been built, they understood that there had to be positives and negatives for it to work. And here in this nucleus of an atom, you did not have that. And they couldn't understand what held it together. And so they came up with this word, nuclear glue. But yet they admit they have no clue how an atom doesn't fly apart, how an atom doesn't blow up. I can give them the answer. All things are held together by Jesus Christ, the Creator. He holds all things together. All things together. He has made the universe. He existed outside of it, before it, before it. He preserves it, and He holds it together. This is the Creator God. This is Jesus Christ. Now before I move to the other statement, I want to just briefly mention this the, this phrase that he uses in, in verse 15. And he says, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Paul is addressing this understanding that the Creator, that, God, that Christ being created, is no different than the angels. And so he is combating this heresy of angel and angel worship. And so what he is saying in this is that no, Jesus is not an angel. The scriptures tell us that. He is not created as the angels. He is above the angels. In fact, the angels worship him. He has authority over them. And they are to worship him, not the other way around. But there were those in the church that were worshiping angels. And so Jesus, Jesus is God over the unseen and seen world. In Him, the visible and the invisible all hold together. And in Him, we find that He is God. Paul then tells us not only that He is God and that He is Creator, but he tells us that this preeminent, supreme Christ is the head of the church. There are a lot of metaphors that are given in Scripture uh, about the church. Uh, we're called the family, the, the flock. We're called the bride of Christ. Um, we often refer to the church as a building, though that's really not the case. Um, we're not the building. The, the people are the church. And so this metaphor that is given here in this passage is that the church is the body of Christ. We are His body. Now, if we are the body and Christ is the head, we cannot look at this as we do um, organization. Um, in human sight, they have a, Ted will tell you, they have a head of their organization. Now, I know that Carrie stepped aside and they have someone coming in to take over as the head of that organization. But that's not the way the church operates as a, or as a, a corporate body. We operate as a living organism. And without the head, the church is dead. You see, Christ is never will never, ever be replaced as the head of the church. What happens is congregations cease to be the body called the church. In other words, Christ is always constant. He was, is, and always will be the same. He is the head of this living organization, the true church. But what happens is congregations cease to be the body of Christ because they are the ones 
that are no longer living into the organism called the church. Either through loss of scripture, the authority of scripture, uh, they decide that they get to interpret God's word in the way they want, and when they do that, they cease to be the body of Christ. Christ is still the body of the true church. They are the ones that have left. You see, Christ, in His infinite wisdom, as the head of the church, He provides unity. He provides the energy. He provides the diversity. He provides the spiritual gifts. He provides the ministry. He is the one that calls you to serve and use the gifts that He has given you for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And if you are a believer, as we have said before, you have a gift for the upbuilding of the body of Christ called the church. Now whether you're using that or not is another story. But you have that as the indwelling spirit dwells in you as a believer. So Christ as the head of the church, He holds the chief position. Paul says that so that in Him, Himself will become first place in everything. Christ is to take first place in all things. And if He has not taken first place in the church and or our lives, we have a problem in the church. We have a problem. Paul defines further what it means to be the head of the body. He says that he is the firstborn of the dead. Was Jesus the first one to be raised from the dead? No. In fact, in his own ministry, Jesus raised from the dead. Here's the difference. Those that were raised in the Old Testament from the dead, those that were raised in the New Testament recorded in Scripture from the dead all died again. The difference with Jesus being the firstborn of the dead is that when Christ was crucified and He rose on the third day, He rose to new life and He conquered death so that all who have belief in Him too will conquer death. He is the firstborn. He was raised to new life so that He exists exactly the way Scripture depicts who He is as the head of the church. Paul says it this way in Philippians 2. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, that those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, that every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. He reigns supreme. He is God, He is Creator, and He is the head of the church because He followed the plan of salvation that God had put in place from Genesis 3.15. That He would crush Satan and ultimately he would return and claim all who have faith in Him. Paul sums up this hymn, these verses 15 through 19 in verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. It's similar to the verse that I read in 2.9, for in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The Father was pleased. The Father's good pleasure was for all things to dwell in His Son, Jesus Christ. He became the visible image of the invisible Father God. He is divine. And in Him rest the power and the attributes of God. Paul would tell the church at Colossae, you don't need to worship angels. You don't need a secret knowledge. 
You don't need to lift up that you've got to follow these ceremonial laws. Colossi Church, Church of the 21st century, Pope Church, what you need is in Christ alone. There is no other. Christians that share, we share in this fullness. If you go to John 1.16, it reads this way. And as John is writing this, he is talking to us as believers. He says, for His fullness, the fullness of Christ, His fullness, we, the believer, have all received. And then this is what He says. Grace upon grace. We have received the grace of Jesus Christ by being in Him alone. Because there is no other. Paul wanted to combat this understanding of who Christ was and he uses this great hymn, this great understanding of who Christ is to combat the heresy. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. He is the supreme God, above, exalted above all things. So here's my question today to end the sermon. What is your cup? Do you have a cup that needs to be painted over because you've placed something before the supreme Christ, before the one who has saved you. Da Vinci said this, nothing will take the attention away from the face of my master. And so often, we place a cup before Him. And that cup may be our work, our family, our bank account. You name it. It becomes before Christ. Paul says, He is to take first place in all things. How is it, church? What place does He have in your life? Or maybe today you and I need to take a brush and paint over that thing that covers His face so that again the face of the Master has our attention. May it be so. Father, what a wonderful passage you have given us in Scripture to give this understanding of who Jesus Christ is, who He is in our life, and who He is in the life of the church. And Father, we would pray today that if there is any misunderstanding of who Christ is, that you would give us understanding through the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that that you would help us to set aside anything that we place before you. So that as the Apostle Paul says in this passage, that you take first place in all things. Because one day, all things will be set right. Christ will return. And He'll set this upside down world right side up. He will claim and receive those who have come to faith in Him. And they will dwell for eternity with God. With Him. So Father, we thank You that You, that you choose us to come to faith in You so that He becomes Lord, Savior over our life. Thank You, Father. 
We pray this through your Son's name, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.